little over 30 years ago, I went off to college wanting to study leadership. But because I also grew up the son of an Air Force officer, I grew up wanting to become a pilot. So I chose the Naval Academy. It was a good choice. This place takes leadership so seriously that they even have an entire building called Loose Hall dedicated just to the study of leadership. But at some, at some point, I became concerned that I wasn't going to find enough leadership in the cockpit of a single-seat aircraft. So at that point, I gave up my childhood dream, and I decided instead to become a practitioner of leadership in the Navy SEAL teams. And I became a task unit commander deployed in the wars after 9-11. And it was then deployed to those wars that I started to confront some very deep questions about everything I thought I knew about leadership. And it happened in particular one night in Western Iraq when my leadership almost killed two of my own people. We had been conducting reconnaissance missions along the Euphrates River, looking for insurgents. And back then, our greatest threat was improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, bombs in the road. And so we would go to great lengths to plan our missions to avoid these IEDs and minimize this threat. And one night, we had a unit returning to our base. And thinking that I had the best judgment, thinking that I had all the knowledge as the leader, I changed the plan. I made a change to the plan, and what happened next was as predictable as sunrise. One of our vehicles took a direct hit from an IED, and the two soldiers in the front seat of this vehicle very nearly lost their lives. And it was 100% the result of my bad decision-making. Now, the good news is those two men lived. And they only lived because they got rapidly evacuated to a trauma center that happened to be just down the road. And they happened to get there in the nick of time. And the evacuation was chaos. And I wasn't even on the scene. I had grown up thinking that good leaders make good decisions. And yet my decision-making almost killed those two men. In an evacuation that had nothing to do with my leadership or decision-making is what allowed them to live. When I retired from the Navy, I looked for a new way to get outside my comfort zone, and I ended up taking up beekeeping. Sadly, this is the first summer where I find myself not having any bees at all. I wasn't paying close enough attention this summer, and they got overcrowded and they swarmed, which means they left to find a new home. And swarming behavior is one of the miraculous things that bee colonies do. As a group, they make these exceptional decisions without the benefit of a leader. We may call her the queen bee, but she's not the leader. She just lays eggs. Bee colonies are a flat, non-hierarchical system. And the research suggests that bee colonies have evolved this way because it protects the colony from the bad effects of any single bee with bad judgment. So you see, my lessons in war and in beekeeping were the same. That strong, domineering leaders confuse the fact that they have extra authority with the idea that they have extra judgment. That strong, domineering leaders expose us to risk that strong, domineering leaders are an impediment to good decision-making. So if we say someone's a strong leader, what does that mean? And is it the same thing as saying that they're effective? Similarly, when we call a leader weak, is that to say that they're ineffective? And why do we so often confuse charisma with leadership. In my experience, we skip over these important questions. And what we do instead is we preach. We preach the virtue of things like humility as the number one secret to good leadership. But this just circles us back 
around to the same problem. Because if humble leaders are so good, if humility is the answer to leadership, how do we explain successful leaders like Steve Jobs or Walt Disney, who went on to great success not being known for their leadership, being humble? How do we explain the election of Donald J. Trump? Trump may be an extreme case, but he is not an isolated case. If humility is so good, how do we explain the fact that narcissistic personality types are still overrepresented by far in senior leader positions? You see, I went to the Naval Academy to study leadership because we believe that leadership can be taught. We believe that great leaders are made, not born. And yet study after study after study suggests that the question of who becomes a leader in life mostly comes down to things like gender or stature or the width of our face. If leadership is so much about things we learn, why is that who emerges as a leader in life comes down to things we're born with? Until last year, among Fortune 500 CEOs, there were more men named John than there were women. That would be sensible if men were particularly high-performing with their leadership. But that's not the case. In fact, the number one thing most organizations can do to immediately get a boost in performance is to hire a female CEO. So the science of leadership would tell us that our leaders should reflect humility and diversity. And yet we keep ending up with narcissistic men. So in my 30 years of studying leadership, I've concluded that it's still less a science and it's more a mythology. That's why three years ago I founded the McChrystal Group Leadership Institute and co-wrote this book, Leaders, Myth, and Reality. And the book opens with a vignette of, predictably, a man, General George Washington, America's first president crossing the Delaware River. And this is one of America's most recognizable and famous paintings. Now, I tell you, I know relatively little about American history, but I happen to know a great deal about this one painting. And I only know a lot about this one painting because I spent six years working in the White House for both Presidents Bush and Obama. And when I worked in the White House, I spent an unusual amount of time sitting on a particularly comfortable couch. This couch was in the West Wing lobby of the White House. And just above this couch hung a reproduction painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. And so as I was sitting on that couch all those hours, tour groups would come through the West Wing. And the tour guide would stop the tour group right in front of me and tell the group about the painting hanging just over my head. So I learned a lot about this one painting. <laughs> and I've showed this painting to thousands of people over the years. And I always ask them the same question. Look at Washington and tell me the first word that comes to mind. Exactly. I keep hearing the same words over and over again. Confidence, stoic, strong. And what I learned about this painting all those hours sitting on the couch is that it's a fiction. The Delaware River never froze that way. That's the wrong flag. The boat's going the wrong way. And Washington did not cross the Delaware in a little rowboat. And if you do a little digging, you can find the more accurate depiction of Washington crossing the Delaware. And sure enough, yes, he's standing at the front of the boat. And yes, he is looking forward. But here in the more accurate depiction, Washington's right hand has a firm grip on the wheel of a cannon. Why? because that's what real people do in a boat <laughs> at night going to war. They don't do this 
Why not? Because it's ridiculous. <laughs> but nobody ever offers the word ridiculous to describe Washington. That's because all of us unknowingly subscribe to the mythology of leadership. We all expect too much of our leaders. We all exaggerate what our leaders are capable of. Now, while I spent a lot of time sitting on that couch, I did get out of the White House from time to time. And one of the more interesting trips I ever took was when I accompanied President Obama down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where he met with the team that did the raid on Bin Laden. The president flew down, he gave the team some awards, he got a debrief, and we flew home that night. And on the way home, I asked the president for his reflections about the trip. And what he told me was that he had been struck by the way the team leader did the debrief. And what he was referring to is the fact that when they turned over the briefing to the team leader, the team leader's debrief consisted of, Mr. President, my team will now debrief you. And that was it. And that's surprising, because few of us would actually do that. Most of us would feel some temptation to own that moment. And it's striking because it's an example of what we call humble leadership, or a technical term, servant leadership. Leadership where the leader believes their job is to celebrate the success of the team. Leadership where the leader believes that all the power is with the team, not with them. Leadership where the leader believes their job is to enable their people, not to command them. And servant leadership is known to be powerful. And it's not new, it's been around for a while. And it's rare, it's hard to find. But it's also somewhat misunderstood. I once had the opportunity to catch up with that team leader who had impressed the president. And I asked him, where do you get your leadership from? Why do you lead this way? And his answer was simply to say, what choice did I have? How else would you lead a team like that? And his answer suggests one of the greatest myths about leadership. We tend to believe that leadership rests in the leader. We tend to believe that it's the leader that drives the leadership. We tend to see it this way, as a hierarchy with the leader at the top. But the reality is that we should flip it around. The reality is that leadership rests mostly by the followers. But this raises another question. Because if leadership really rests with the followers, why do we even have this thing called leadership? Why don't we just operate more like a bee colony? Well, it turns out that millions of years ago, our earliest ancestors were doing just that. They were a hunter-gatherer species, and they were non-hierarchical, with outstanding leaders. And then, relatively recently, about 10,000 years ago, we discovered agriculture, and we became an agrarian society with growing levels of hierarchy and standing permanent leaders. And this has been a consistent feature of the human species ever since. And so you see, our evolutionary wiring is conflicted. On the one hand, we have a preference for flat egalitarianism, but on the other hand, we have familiarity with hierarchy. On the one hand, we want our leaders to be average. On the other hand, we want our leaders to be exceptional. We humans are a walking paradox. And because leadership is a human endeavor, it too can be paradoxical. A great example is America's 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. And if you come to my hometown of Washington, D.C., you can visit the Lincoln Memorial. And if you walk into the memorial and you look up, you will find inscribed on the wall the words of the Gettysburg Address. And there at the top you will note the famous line 
hearkening back to millions of years ago, all men are created equal. And then if you look up to Lincoln himself, you might note that one of his hands is in a fist and the other hand is relaxed, symbolizing the fact that Lincoln's leadership was effective because it was a combination of both his strength and his compassion. This tension reveals the ways in which sometimes we want our leaders to stand up, open their mouths, and deliver us a rousing speech. And sometimes we want our leaders to sit down, shut their mouths, and listen. This tension explains why it is that sometimes we want the master who inspires us with a particular vision for the future. But sometimes we want the servant who allows us to achieve that vision in our own way. The reality of leadership is that it reflects the duality of human nature. And that's why we experience leadership as a paradox. And there is no greater paradox than finding strength in weakness. We like to celebrate Washington's strength as him crossing the Delaware. But the reality is that America's first president was actually America's humblest president. George Washington refused the trappings of power. He refused a third term. He voluntarily stepped down. At a time when all of his counterparts were taking the title, Your Majesty, he took the title, Mr. President. We may insist on seeing him as a master, but he insisted on us calling him Mr. That's why we need to stop referring to our leaders as either weak or strong. Because so-called strong leaders expose us to weakness through their domineering styles. And so-called weak leaders are often the strongest because their humility unlocks the power in all of us. My most memorable moment working for America's 43rd president was when President Bush simply invited me to join him on a bike ride. And my most memorable moment working for America's 44th president was when President Obama stepped aboard Air Force One and told us about his experience the previous night as a father watching his oldest daughter go to her prom. The most effective leaders are the ones who impress us, not only with their bold sense of vision, but with their bold sense of humanity. And the true test of leadership is whether our leaders reflect both sides of this duality. We need leaders strong enough to confess their weaknesses. We need leaders strong enough to profess their ignorance. We need leaders who will give us not only a bold sense of who we want to be, but equally an honest sense of who we really are. Thank you.